Welcome back to the channel. I want to talk about a paper that's out now in JAMA Network Open. It's from the Norwegians. It's about long COVID in kids and adolescents. It's pretty important stuff. Let's take a look. It's entitled, The Prevalence and Characteristics Associated with Post-COVID-19 Condition, PCC, that's what they're calling long COVID, among non-hospitalized adolescents and young adults. So it's kids, goes up to the age of 25. It's adolescents, young adults. It's not hospitalized. It's COVID-19. Let's get into it. The authors did something a while back in Norway when you could, because back then there was a group of kids that hadn't yet had COVID, and there's a group of kids that had had COVID. And what they did was they took kids coming in for PCR testing at a central or a centralized service, and they delineated those who had documented COVID-19 from those that didn't. If you didn't have COVID-19 and you entered into the eligibility criteria, they would actually test you for antibodies to make sure you not only did you not have it in that moment, but you never had it before. And if you did, they'd exclude you. So what they got was a pristine group of kids and young adults who had COVID-19 and a pristine group that didn't. And they followed them out in time with a battery of blood tests, surveys, very comprehensive sort of analysis that lasted for six months. And ultimately 382 COVID-19 cases completed the study and 85 non-COVID cases. Those non-COVID cases are being matched by a number of covariates and demographics so that they're otherwise comparable to the COVID-19 cases. And again, all of these people are seeking testing, presumably because many felt sick. Some of them might be seeking testing for other reasons, but here you're comparing people who had COVID-19 when they sought testing to those who didn't. Maybe they had something else going on. And they're gonna look at PCC, the post-COVID condition. They're also gonna look at post-infective fatigue syndrome, which is a WHO definition. And PCC and PIFS, okay, it's a lot of, a lot of letters, basically long COVID at six months was defined as the primary and secondary outcomes respectively. And the study had a power of approximately 80% to detect a relative risk of 1.5. So what does this mean? It's always important to look at the power calculation of a study. There are people out there who say, oh, the trial is under, the study is underpowered. It's not a trial, it's a study. The study is underpowered. Well, it actually was powered to detect a increase of 1.5, which is a very modest increase in this condition. If what you're gonna say is that COVID is so decimating, it's so problematic and causes long COVID in unprecedented amounts, you wouldn't expect 1.5, it would be like 20 or 40 or you know something massive difference in risk if you had COVID versus not having COVID for having this long COVID syndrome. So I actually think the power calculation is really pretty good actually. Here is table one. Table one is just basically showing you that they did a good job when they got there matched negative controls. They're comparable in age. They're comparable in BMI. There's some differences in whether or not they're from Europe or outside of Europe, but they're all in Norway. Um, other than that, there weren't many differences at all. They have similar comorbidities and they're otherwise comparable. And if somebody can tie together how that one factor would make any difference, I encourage them to in the comments because I can't think of a way. Here is the key primary endpoint study. The study is best suited to assess the primary endpoint, and this is the key result. At six months follow-up, 184 out of 379 individuals in the COVID positive group, again, these kids and young adults definitely had COVID, and 40 out of 85 in the COVID negative group were classified as having PCC. Those percentages are 48.5 and 47.1. That's no difference at all essentially the same point estimate. And it's nearly half that these symptoms that we're calling long COVID are so common in this age group that nearly half of people experience them, whether you had COVID or didn't have COVID. When it comes to the post-infective fatigue syndrome, the PIFS, the answer is 14 and 8.2. The risk difference crosses null. It's basically a null result as well. I didn't find a difference there. When you start to look at the battery of differences between the positive and negative group, you find that there weren't that many. You know, they're the same hemoglobin, the same leukocyte count, the same CRP, the same D-dimer, the same pro-BNP, the same antibody. Oh, nope, the antibody title was different because of course, if you had COVID, you had COVID. And if you didn't have COVID, you didn't have COVID, okay? So that's telling you that they actually, you know, this is a properly controlled study. Fatigue, post-exertional malaise, cognitive symptoms, respiratory symptoms, symptoms of anxiety. It's all a wash. It didn't matter that you had COVID. In fact, as you're gonna see in the multivariable analysis, COVID has nothing to do with the symptoms of long COVID. Here's that multivariable analysis. SARS-CoV-2 at baseline, relative risk 1.06. It was powered to look at for 1.5, a very modest increase. It's 1.06, it's totally null. 
in other words, there are definitely half of kids who are going to have the long COVID syndrome. It has nothing to do with whether or not they had COVID or not. COVID, it's just as nothing to do with that fact. Female sex, 1.16, but it's not significant. P-value 0.16. I saw somebody else trying to take a P-value 0.16 and spin it into something significant. It's not. Age is null. BMI is null. Blah, blah, blah. Everything is null except for loneliness, which is not good. Physical activity prior to infection, which is being inactive, predisposed due to long COVID syndrome. And the severity of the symptoms at baseline, whether it was COVID or the flu, that had some bearing on whether or not you're going to have these symptoms down the road. And the final multivariable model, the symptom severity component remained the main risk factor for PCC, relative risk 1.41, and for PIFS, additionally loneliness and low levels of physical activity were associated. The symptom severity correlated with the emotional maladjusting component and with female sex. Okay, so that's why those two were not associated with multivariable modeling. This is such an awesome figure. I'm showing you on the screen right now. This is such an awesome figure. When I was a kid, I used to look at the map and in the map they had a legend and the legend had all of the cities on the map, like California, San Francisco, Bakersfield, Los Angeles, San Diego. And on the other axis, it had San Francisco, Bakersfield, Los Angeles, San Diego. And you could look across this figure and it would tell you the driving distance between any two cities. This was back before you had your iPhones and all your fancy bullshit. This was back when People were giants and we would navigate with actual pieces of paper, okay? And had this legend. This is the exact same kind of thing. It's not telling you the driving distance between two cities. It's telling you the correlation between two, two variables in the data set. It's not all the variables in the data set, by the way. You can read the detailed explanation and you can pull the, the code for this if you want to look at all the variables. White means no correlation. Red means it's positively correlated and blue means it's negatively correlated. But basically stronger colors mean more correlation. And what you see here what you see here clearly is that there's a whole bunch of variables that have really, you know, no correlation. And there's a bunch of stuff that's really tightly correlated. We're going to look at that in a second, but let me read you how they summarize it. The main results of the present study are the following. The prevalence of PCC after acute COVID-19 was approximately 50%, but was equally high in the control group. That's why you need to have controls, actually. See the paper by Allison Haslam and myself in the American Journal of Medicine. Acute COVID-19 was not an independent risk factor for PCC or long covid didn't matter if you had COVID or not. Severity of symptoms at baseline, irrespective of SARS-CoV-2 status, main risk factor. Okay, now back to that figure. I put an arrow on the screen. I'm not sure you're going to see it. It's in the lower left-hand corner. It says COVID positive. And as you can see, COVID positive has nothing to do with any of this. That constellation of stuff you see on the right, that's linking anxiety, depression, loneliness, emotional awareness, um, neuroticism. Those are all linked together. There is something going on. I mean, kids and young adults in this age group, half of them are feeling something. That's the red. That's the something they're feeling. But the thing is, it has nothing to do with Bakersfield. It has nothing to do with long, with nothing to do with having had COVID. But they are feeling something in, 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 in maybe an unacceptable proportion of people. All right, closing thoughts. What are my closing thoughts here? My closing thoughts here are one, you know, this illustrates why you need control arms and people who don't have control arms are not doing good science. And that includes the CDC who put out like misleading figures like one in five people have long COVID, ridiculous, because they're not running control groups here. They're saying 50% of kids have long COVID, except it had nothing to do with COVID. 50% of kids are not feeling good and there's no distinction as to whether or not you had COVID. So how much of that is attributable to COVID? Exactly 0% of it is attributable to COVID. So COVID is not doing anything more than what not having COVID would do. That's what this paper is telling you. The CDC is getting it wrong because they don't know about randomization. They also don't know about control groups. Here's not a case where you would randomize. You don't randomize people to putative harms, but they're also not aware of randomization because they lack basic epidemiologic understanding of most things. That's why they've done such a bad job. And if you really want to know why they've done a bad job, you can check out a paper we published on the preprint server, SSRN, on statistical and numerical errors of the CDC. Actually, I need to do a whole video on this. We put this paper out a couple weeks ago. I think I was in Europe at the time when it came. Um, they really did a terrible job, so we're going to come back to them. Um, that's point number one. Point number two is anybody who's suffering definitely deserves our compassion and definitely deserves strategies to improve how they feel. Those strategies need to be subjected to randomized control trials. You can't just do things for people who have long, quote unquote, long COVID. You need to actually know if what you're doing is improving their outcomes. And if not, you know, that's the classic snake oil salesman, charlatanism, etc.
Point number three, with time, all of these kids are going to get long COVID. They're not going to get long COVID. With time, all these kids are going to get COVID. So having this kind of controlled analysis is actually probably limited to a certain time period. And this and other controlled studies, like the one I did a video on previously, that might be the best we get because soon there's going to be no control group. Um, although not emphasized in the paper, point number four, there is no biochemical abnormality to explain these symptoms in kids. There was no, nothing segregated out by high sensitivity troponin, et cetera. To some degree, that might be moot because COVID itself wasn't associated. And then the final point is, the final point is, why did long COVID in teenagers and young adults have to be so bad? It was bad if you read the media coverage. And it didn't have to be so bad based on controlled studies, as this study shows that there's no link to COVID at all. That's not the reason why it was so bad. It was so bad in the media coverage because it had to be bad. If your starting point is that we need to keep these kids and young adults in restrictions, if that's your starting point, and somebody comes to you with the IFR in this age group, they're going to put that in your face and say, that's really low. Isn't it irrational? to make these kids follow stricter precautions for this when the IFR is as low as it is for flu and you never made them do that for their whole lives? And you're stuck. You're stuck by accepting that that is irrational and maybe we shouldn't subject them to restrictions. But then they say, but by the way, I got a new thing for you. It's long COVID and it's terrible. It's the worst thing ever. And it's gonna decimate these kids if you let them get COVID. They need that. They needed that to justify the restrictions in this age group. That's why that was the main driver for its existence, that need so that they could justify the policy they already want in their mind. I think that's how it really played out. Because if you were really a scientist approaching this before you would trumpet it in an Atlantic article, you would do the proper studies like this study to even validate it if it is a thing. You wouldn't just compile anecdotes from Facebook groups. You would have control groups in a study if you were really a scientist. But if you're somebody whose policy goal comes first, then of course you would raise all sorts of propaganda and low quality evidence to support your conclusion. That's what the CDC is, basically. And that's what, you know, the Atlantic Magazine was with their coverage of this issue. So I think it's really bad how this was covered in the media. I think between this, Shemez Ladani's paper, showing that it's not the same kids who have these persistent symptoms, it's coming and going. I think between this and the JAMA Network Open paper I covered previously that shows that long URI actually was worse for health-related quality of life. I think these pieces of evidence, and then finally, the Annals of Internal Medicine paper that shows no biochemical abnormality among people with long COVID symptoms, seeking care at NIH. These things are coalescing to provide clarity. These are controlled studies. This is providing clarity about what this diagnosis is and isn't. That's not to say we don't need to do something about this crisis. It is a crisis in kids. They're feeling these things. It just has nothing to do with having been infected with the virus COVID-19. And maybe that's a good thing because by now they've probably all been infected anyway. So those are my thoughts. Very important paper from the Norwegians. Glad they're keeping science alive still in Scandinavia. As I said before, Denmark agrees with me 100%, and I'm pretty sure they agree with me in Norway as well. So on that positive note, if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. Um, subscribe to Vinay Prasad's Observations and Thoughts, the Substack. I think that will do you well. And subscribe to Sensible Medicine. I do some writing there as well. And uh, I'll be back soon with more coverage, but I thought this was an important article. That's why I'm bringing it to you. And if you want to send people a link to a written version, it's on my Substack. So until next time.